A few years ago, I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside of the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and having nice neighbors close enough not to feel isolated. The area had no streetlights, so it was very dark at night, especially if there were clouds blocking the moonlight. It didn't bother me though. It made my little house feel even more quaint on dark nights. I got home from work one day in midwinter. It was a cloudy night. So, pulling up to my house, I saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I got out of my car, I caught a whiff of cigarette smoke. That was odd, as I'd never smelled that before around the house. I didn't see anyone nearby, so I ignored it and went inside. I had just got off a shift with a few hours of overtime, so I felt pretty tired even though it wasn't even 7 p.m. yet. And I decided to take a shower and call it a night. I woke up sometime later, sure that I'd heard a noise inside of my house. I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work on his way to his night classes. I even gave him a spare key so that he could stop by even if I wasn't home. He would always text me to let me know beforehand though, and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over to my bedside table, picked up my cell phone to see if my friend had sent me any messages. The bright light from my phone screen and number pad blinded me. These were the days before phones had a light sensor that would dim the screen in the dark. Man, this particular phone was so bright that I could use it as a flashlight. Through squinted eyes, I could make out that it was a nine-something, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread text or not. I set my phone aside and I called out my friend's name. There were a couple of seconds of silence before I heard loud footfalls as someone started running through the bottom floor of my house. I leapt out of bed and I ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time that I had opened the door and stepped inside. That house had three rooms upstairs, two bedrooms on either side of the hallway, the one that I was in and a spare, and a bathroom at the end. The bedroom doors were both closed, but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever was in my house thunder down the hallway past my door and into the bathroom. Thank God he did. That gave me enough time to open the attic access in the ceiling of my closet and hoist myself up. I had just started to lift myself up when the person ran back out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside of the attic when my bedroom door had bursted open. I heard footsteps run into my room and stop. When they didn't see me in that room, they ran back to the hallway and into the other room, which just had boxes stacked in a corner, some weights, and a table where I painted miniature models. I guess they decided that if someone were hiding, it would be in the bedroom because they charged back into the room and turned on the light. A moment later, the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched in my attic, just a foot or so away from the access, so I could try to stop them if they started to climb up. From my vantage point, all I could see was from about their knee down. They were wearing dirty blue jeans with frayed cuffs and worn work boots. After a few seconds of looking in the closet, they stepped away, and I heard a loud crash come from my room followed by a scream of frustration and anger. That scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. It reminded me far too much of my stepfather, who would scream in a similar way when he lost his temper. He would eventually be put in a mental hospital for several mental disorders that resulted in erratic and violent tendencies. The man in my house ran back down the stairs, 
I heard crashes and clatters as things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over. I stayed crouched in the attic. I had left my cell phone when I ran for the closet, and I wasn't certain I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noises stopped. I started counting slowly. When I reached 1,000, I decided that it was safe enough to climb down and call the police. The first thing that I noticed when I exited the closet was the intruder had flipped my bed over, I assume in an attempt to find me. That was the loud noise that I'd heard after he had stepped away from the closet. I couldn't find my cell phone, so I went to the landline by the bed and I called the police. I waited in my room until I heard them call out from downstairs. The first floor was a mess, but I had expected that. Chairs had been knocked over, the sofa had been flipped. All the books and pictures and knickknacks I had on my shelves were strewn across the floor. The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened and all the boxed canned foods had been thrown to the ground. As far as I could tell though, the only thing missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked the house from top to bottom. They found that the side door had been forced open by something like a crowbar. They also found a few cigarette butts along my fence line, along with some foil and an empty pen tube, which the police said people often use to smoke. So they think he had been watching my house for a while. I realized that he must have been out there smoking a cigarette when I got home. They collected up the evidence and told me that I should stay with family or friends that night and get that door fixed as soon as possible. I opted to just not sleep. I moved a shelf over to block the broken door and I spent the next couple of hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with a flashlight and shine it along the fence line where the police found these cigarette butts and foil, but I didn't see anything. The next day, I called to have the door fixed and the motion lights installed at the back and sides of my house. I ran a phone cable up into the attic, and I added a landline. I never wanted to be stuck up there without a phone again. Nothing else ever happened at that house though. I lived there for another three years without any incident. One more precaution I took was practicing getting out of my bed, going to my closet, and climbing into the attic as quickly and quietly as possible. I even kept at it when I moved, except now I go to a crawl space at the back of the closet instead of the attic. I try not to think about what would have happened if I had been a bit slower getting to the attic or if he hadn't gone into the bathroom at the end of the hallway first. This happened two summers ago, while I was house-sitting out in California for an older couple that I had met at a conference for work. But it seemed like a dream scenario. The couple wanted a vacation in Hawaii for two weeks, but they didn't want to bore their cats, and I had been chatting with them about wanting to visit California again, where they happened to live, because I had loved it the first time that I went there. And we figured that we could mutually benefit if I came out and a house hat for them. So I flew out there and they showed me around for a few days. Taught me how to care for the cats, two of them. One that was extremely shy and that I barely saw, which is important later. And their plans. They gave me access to their house and cars. These people were pretty generous. And before I knew it, I had dropped them off at the airport and I was on my own. At first, it really was the dream vacation. I was staying in Oakland and making forays into San Fran, Sonoma, and Monterey. In the mornings, I could walk out the front door and shortly be hiking the pass surrounding nearby Mount Diablo. And I was just ultra content with the world. I was so enamored by the area that I had actually started looking into taking some steps to relocate out there, even... But then one day, about halfway through my final week there, when I got back to the house I felt really odd, 
almost like I shouldn't be going inside. I shook it off and I went inside anyway. It was getting late and I needed to put out dinner for the cats. Once I was inside, I forced myself to ignore how off I felt. And I made some food for myself and went to bed. And I was shocked to find the shy cat hiding under my bed and crying. This was the first time that I would even seen her close up. The entire time that I had been there up to that point, she never left my host's bedroom unless she didn't realize that I was around. Again, I ignored feeling weird and just assumed that she decided that I was okay and went to bed. I did start locking my bedroom door that night though. I also remember that about halfway through that night, I thought that I heard someone walking around in the gravel outside of my window. But after listening for a bit, I didn't hear anything else and I went back to sleep. The day after in the morning, I still felt a little odd, but I kept up with my plans for the day. I drove out to a little music festival in Sonoma and went clothes shopping and had an overall great day. When I got back to the house though, I found the front door locked in a way that I hadn't left it. Basically, my host never locked the deadbolt, only the lower second lock, and that's the only lock that my key worked on, so I never messed with the deadbolt, but it was definitely locked. So, I had to call my host and find the hideaway key, which, to their credit, safely wise, was buried like a whole foot underneath a bush outside, and had definitely not been unearthed for a long time. So I used that and went inside, and kept the key with me just in case it happened again. And it did it, but with a different door. This time, I had stepped out into the garage to get a drink, and when I turned around to go back into the house, the door was shut and locked. I could use my normal key on that door, but I was still pretty bewildered. My home cats are pretty whack but I think in my mind that I was trying to come up with a way that the cats could be locking me out of the house, but I kept coming up empty. I decided that I must have been misunderstanding how the locks worked, and I just wrote it off and started checking and triple checking locks when I went out of the house or out into the garage. That night when I went to bed, the really awful feeling of unease was still there, and so was the shy cat who was clearly unhappy to see me, but also wouldn't leave the room. But again, I just locked my bedroom door and went to sleep. The next morning I felt awful, nausea, body ache. I had no desire to leave the house, so I decided to stay in and Netflix for a day. This vacation stay was like a full two weeks, so I didn't feel like I was in any hurry to get all my touristy things in anyways. But as the day went on, I started to get that feeling of wrongness again, and it morphed into a feeling of being incredibly watched. Around mid-afternoon, it got to the point that I was so uneasy that, even feeling awful, I decided to get out of the house for a bit to shake it off. I was getting a bit low on food, so I went to the grocery store and bought a couple food items that I didn't think would hurt my stomach, and as I started to leave the checkout, the cashier said at the generic, Have a great evening. And I just instantly started crying, shocking myself and that poor cashier, because I just had this intrusive thought that said, You might be the last person to ever say that to me. When I got to my car, I was still crying and my entire body was telling me not to drive back to the house. I couldn't not though, because I didn't want to neglect the cats. So I drove back, parked in the driveway, and convinced myself after about half an hour to just go open the front door. Once I did that, I thought that I would get over it and be able to go in and at least feed the cats, and then maybe I would get a hotel room after. But my body physically would not let me inside. It was like I was stuck in the entryway. I then made a deal with myself. I would yell into the house saying that I had already called the police and that they were on their way. 
and panic logic. I figured that would make anyone in the house leave. So I faced the inside of the house, looking down the hallway towards the bedrooms, and I did just that. The second that I had finished saying, They're almost here, so if you want to avoid being arrested, you need to leave now. The light in my host's room turned on, and I heard some banging. I immediately hightailed it back to the car, called the police for real, and proceeded to have a mental breakdown while talking to the dispatcher. Once they got there, they checked the house and they didn't find anyone, but the double doors in my host's bedroom were left wide open, so I'm glad the cats didn't get out, and there was a pile of food wrappers in the corner behind the blinds, so they said it looked like someone had been there. What makes it so scary to me is that nothing was taken, and that based on the shape of the house, that would have been the perfect vantage point to see me in the living room, as I stayed home sick. To explain this, the house was in an L shape, and from the windows into the garden that were in my host's bedroom, you could see into the living room windows. Also, the minute that the police were gone, they said they couldn't prove anyone was there. There were no signs of forced entry, and we couldn't get a hold of my host immediately to verify if anything had been taken, which once they were back, they verified that nothing had been taken, so they said that they would patrol for a bit but nothing else. The shy cat was right back in my host's bedroom, and I didn't see her again until I left to go back home at the end of the trip. So, basically, I think the intruder had been there at least two days, forcing her to choose between two strangers and leading her to choose the one that was at least a little less strange, being me. This all messed me up pretty badly, especially because they didn't catch the person and didn't seem to have any desire to look, and I still had to stay in that house for the next three days. Luckily, nothing else odd happened, and I didn't feel anything off the rest of the time that I was there, but by then, the damage had already been done. I've never felt completely safe in a home without doing a complete search before bed since then. But I am extremely glad that my gut spoke up. I guess I would rather have some residual anxiety than be dead. Back in late 2016, I, a female then 23, was moving from NYC to Boston. Two of my college friends, also female, agreed to live with me and we started looking for an apartment. We were fond of one place in particular out in the suburbs next to a forest park. I got to talking with the landlord, an older man probably in his 70s, and mentioned that I repair antique dolls. He excitedly said that he had a doll his mother's uncle had brought her back from Germany in World War I, and the elastic holding the arms on had worn out. I said that I could definitely fix it and we exchanged contact info. He was firm that my work would have to take place at his house since he was nervous about moving a fragile antique, but at the time I didn't think anything of it. Now that I'm older and wiser, I know doll doctor house calls are not the norm. Ultimately, we went with another place closer to the city proper, but I didn't want to lose a prospective doll repair client. I called him a week or so after we got settled in and once again, he seemed delighted to get his family heirloom fixed. Nothing seemed odd until I asked for his address to work out how to get there. Oh, don't worry about it, he said. I'll pick you up. What's your new address? My eagerness cooled a little. I tried to put him off by saying that I didn't want to bring him out of his way and that I could get myself there no problem, but he kept insisting never even told me what town that he lived in, just repeated over and over again that it was fine, that he would pick me up and it would be no trouble at all. Eager for the business and a bit embarrassed about my paranoia, I finally caved. I told him my address and we arranged a date and a time for him to pick me up. Over the next few days, literally everyone in my life told me to call and cancel. My housemates asked if I had lost my mind, 
My mom and sister both told me that I was driving them mad with worry. To be honest, I think I was looking for an excuse to call the whole thing off. It just didn't feel right. I called the evening before the appointment day and left a message saying that something had come up. I added that if he was free the following Monday, my housemate could drive me over so that he wouldn't be inconvenienced, which was true. She had offered in a last ditch effort to make me see sense. The next day, the time we had picked rolled around. I was sitting in the living room working on a sewing project when a car pulled up in front of the house. I looked down, and my heart jumped when I recognized the old man sitting in the driver's seat. He didn't look up, didn't appear to see me, just sat there what felt like a century until finally, he started the car and drove off. I never saw him again. He never contacted me about getting his mother's precious doll repaired. Then maybe I was overreacting to an innocent old guy with poor social skills who forgot to call back. But I had a bad feeling about the situation and ultimately think that I did the right thing. The part that creeps me out the most is, I almost had this man for my landlord. I could have been fine or it could have been much, much worse.